Oh, good morning, good morning. On another foggy, drizzly, chilly morning. Oh my goodness. For all of you people that are like, hey, we need the rain. Do you realize that it has been raining every weekend, three days a week for the past month? Oh, we're in a drought. Okay, great, we're in a drought. I don't think so, but if you say so. I'm no farmer, but I do know when it's been raining a lot. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Church Town Church of God, as you can see. My office is empty at the moment. I've got my little spot all set up there to talk about God's Holy Spirit this morning, and I am in a bit of a mood, a good mood overall. Got a little doctor's appointment today. General maintenance, don't worry about a thing. The old body, the old guy needs to be maintained. I'll be turning 58 October 6th, Father. Thank you for 58 years. Oh, haven't made it yet. Thank you for every day that I've been alive, Father. <laughs> you are the breath of life. And we love and appreciate you very much. In Jesus' name, we pray that you would guide our conversation this morning. In your word, as part of our service to you, Lord, may we share and spread the good news that Christ lived, Christ died, and Christ rose again. Good morning, April. Good morning, everybody. There's my big, ugly face right there. Uh, I thought I was supposed to have the light on. You know how the a light comes on. Here it is. Hold on a second. There we go. Let there be light. I saw the light. I saw the light. What a weekend. What a weekend it was in the middle of that tropical storm and all these folks still came to church and we're carrying umbrellas and we're trying to warm the church up and it was good morning. Good morning, everybody. Oh, so many folks. Good morning, everybody. Interact with the video. That's how the video gets out. That's how the live stream gets out. That's how I turn it into a reel and it gets out. And you know why I want to do that? Because we're talking about Christian stuff on here. We rarely, if ever, unless we're joking around or what have you, talk about things that are not Christian stuff. And the world needs more good, orthodox Christian stuff. Man, we are being drowned out. And the church, and I understand, the church is not going to be going, you know, doing the things of the world to, to you know, I, I, I once went, when I was studying at Weinbrenner and we were studying church development, I once went to a church, a big mega church thing with, they went all day Sunday morning and Saturday night and they had everything that you can possibly imagine and it was acres upon acres of campus and auditoriums and all this stuff and they said, well, We'll do anything this side of sin to get people to come to church. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I kind of get it, but you're taking on an awful lot right there. You know what you do to get people to come to church? You keep preaching the gospel as it is written in God's word. Now, I, and that's, I don't know. Maybe I'm just too dumb to know otherwise. These were marketers. There wasn't a pastor among them. The guy was a former marketer of Microsoft, and they were all in marketing and sales. And I, I asked him the question. I said, so who, who corrals your theology? What, what is your rudder? You know, you are reading scripture and interpreting it through your own lens and then sharing it and calling yourselves pastor. And I said this to them, who keeps you orthodox? And they said, well, we gather, you know, every Sunday morning and talk about what each one of us is going to talk about because there were multiple auditorium. Like, oh, okay. So anyway, there's my opening salvo. That's Christian stuff, right? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Turning on the Lights Tuesday morning. Good morning, good morning. Josh and Dee and Sharon and Larry and uh, George, if you're still here, Barry and oh, April and Rick and oh my goodness gracious. We're talking about God's Holy Spirit. We were talking about 
God's Holy Spirit on Sunday, and I made three primary points from the Old Testament. If you weren't watching, I thought it was pretty good. I had a lot of stuff lined up, but I often do that when I preach. Like I know the body of scripture from which I would like to preach and teach. And then I allow Sundays just to happen. And, you know, we go from the top of the funnel, as it were, to the point of the funnel. And, and we preach this. One, we preached that words matter. That's what, actually where we started off. If you control the language, you can control the culture. And that applies to Christian culture, to Christendom. Now, there are extreme examples of that. Like when we began exchanging the word biological sex, the words biological sex, right? Or the sex of a person for the gender of a person. That shift started happening in the 90s. And those two words became synonymous to the fact, to the point where today we say there are only two genders. Well, there are different, those words are two different things. Biological sex is etched in your chromosome. There is male and there is female, period. Gender is a grammatical term. And it, and it deals with a lot of relativity where a word appears in a sentence, how a word is used in, in the other parts of that particular writing, how a word, what words come before it, what words come after it. Gender is a, oh, this is the word we like to hear, gender is a construct. And so if you can take those two words and replace them, then you can say or imply or begin to teach, well, there are way more than two genders. And you know what? There are. When it comes to gender, if you're using the words correctly, the sky's the limit. And this is how successfully the culture has been flipped on its ear. We no longer, some do. Now we're beginning to talk again about biological males and biological females, and we have to add that word in front. But sex and gender have been flip-flopped. And in the old uh, expression from the Princess Bride, right? I think it's Princess Bride. I don't think that word means what you think it means. And so we're arguing against something that is actually true. When we're taught, when we're in the gender affirmation argument, does that make sense? Control the language, control the culture. You could say we we are arguing in uh, in some sort of a vacuum over here against something that actually it, it exists, but we are thinking one thing, and the uh, folks on the other side of the discussion and argument are completely thinking another, and we're using the same word. And then it's just a wash. Oh, so we, we talked about, and I just said that now we have a simpler version. And this is really for Brian. Instead of saying the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, which we can really get our heads around. Father, Father image, Father figure, Father. We, we can have an image of that. We can have that sort of thing. Son, we know that. With that term, we understand. Male, son, right? of the Father, my Father this, my Father that, Jesus says, and so on and so forth. And we also know that he is the Logos, the Word of God, the Word that became flesh as the Son of God, etc. Father, Son, we have good images of those. But then we say the Holy Spirit. And that kind of is more esoteric. It's out there, right? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. What is that? And so for the sake of my own understanding because words matter, I switched my conversation, my internal conversation and the way I express myself. Instead of saying the Holy Spirit, like he, it is some tool that the Father or the Son wields, I tried to express him as God's Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit of God as it is expressed, as he is expressed in the Old Testament the Spirit of God came upon him, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to go there very soon. We talked about that. We talked about how uh, the breath of God is breathed into human beings. We talked about that term ruach, which means breath, which means spirit, which means mind. 
with a breath of God breathed into this unique human creation, the Adam makes human beings unique. And that is very important to understand. The breath of God is breathed into human beings, and that makes human beings unique. And we'll read that in Genesis 2-7. We talk about the Spirit of God being placed in individuals in the Old Testament, and thus they are gifted by God's Holy Spirit to do particular things. Craftsmen do crafty things, right? Builders build. Prophets prophesy. Individuals, and, and we talked about, the, and then we moved on and talked about the 70 of Moses, where the Spirit of God, some of the Spirit is taken from Moses and placed on these 70, and they are filled with the spiritual gifts of justice and discernment, understanding, right? They are going in leadership. They are going to take over some of that leadership. So we talked about four things. The precursor was the fact of how I am going to address God's Holy Spirit. He is a he. He is not an it. And then we talked about the uniqueness of God's Holy Spirit being breathed into mankind. And we talked about God's Holy Spirit being placed on an individual. And then we talked about God's Holy Spirit being placed on a group. So when we look at, I want to expand the depth and the breadth of our understanding of God's Holy Spirit as a, as a person of the Trinity the triune nature of Yahweh. And I've seen this as I sat on the Vocations Commission more than a few times individuals came with this idea that God, the Holy Spirit, is this tool that God uses. He can draw from himself and use it for this, that, and the other thing. And as Orthodox Christians, we believe in the uniqueness and the mystery of the Trinity, the triune nature of our holy sovereign God. And so we're like, well, we would license you as a pastor, but you're not really a Christian. So there's that. And it's a very common understanding slash misunderstanding. So where are we going with this? Well, today I wanna to talk about the power Let's talk about the power. Let's go to Genesis 2-7 and see that. It was so unique on Friday when I wanted to go to Genesis 2-7. And this scripture is so familiar. And it was like I was blinded. I couldn't find the scripture. Do you remember that on Friday? And we ended up talking about faith and, and how circumstances do not define us and that we have faith in the ultimate outcome. We have faith in the hand of God upon us. We have faith in the comfort and security of being a son or daughter of the Most High God and our circumstances cannot shake that. Remember the example, like your circumstances are right here. No, your circumstances are over here where they belong in the bigger picture. And man, that is, excuse me, exactly what we needed to talk about on Friday. I received messages. How did you know what I was going through? Like, I didn't know what you were going through. I didn't know what you were thinking. He did. And so we talked about that and how circumstances are not, they do not define the Christian. Our circumstances occur not be even because we are Christian. The fact that we are Christian, that we are followers, good morning, Megan, of Jesus Christ, supersedes all circumstances. And we can, and the faith that it takes to understand why certain things happen to certain people. I pray for healing and I don't get it. They pray for healing, they seem to get it. I don't know if it's random. I don't know if it's the hand of God, but I do know that God is sovereign over all, over both of those situations. And I have faith that if intervention on the part of God and his Holy Spirit is warranted, if he decides that he will do it, and if he doesn't, I'm okay. My faith supersedes that. So anyway, it was powerful. It was powerful. But now let's read about the power of life. The power of life. I'm going to go and I'm going to use two 
really, like I said, I always hate to use the word common scriptures or perhaps well-known scriptures. Genesis 2, 7, let's just begin at the beginning <clears throat> of two. Well, no, we'll begin with four. Because Genesis 1 and 2 is very strange. It, it's almost like the, they, you know that the chapter breaks in Scripture weren't there when Scripture was written, right? So the chapter breaks were added, all the verses were added, all the subtitles then and subheadings were added, all of that stuff. And so the break between 1 and 2 is awkward because 2 begins with the end of 1 and then goes into another unique account of creation. The two combined give us a really wonderful picture of God at work in creation. And this is what I love about two, the, the most, one of the, one, <laughs> or say that too, it's what I love about two, until I get to a few verses later, and then a few verses later. Good morning, Mary. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. And there was no one to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Breathe on me, breath of God. That is a very theologically sound statement in song and that is what part of what ruach means wind breath spirit breathing into the nostrils of the man the adam singular at this point in time the adam the man the human breathe in the breath of life where do we read in scripture that God laid the animals that created the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky and breathed in them the breath of life. I believe that this is unique. Does God's spirit create life and sustain all life? Yes, but why in scripture, on several accounts, are human beings, you know, in Genesis 1, we see how the human beings are uniquely made. All of the heavens and the earth are made and ordered, then human beings. Here we see the human being. And then here we see the Adam being created and the breath of God being breathed in there. Why isn't that mentioned with all of the other animals? Well, it's because we are created in the image of God. And the breath of God, the breath of life within us is unique and different. Spirit, mind, reflection of God's likeness, reason, curiosity, free moral agency, sense of humor, creativity, all of those things, a sense of justice, a sense of what is right and wrong, innate. Why? Because we are reflections of our creator. And I believe that through Genesis 1 and 2, we see that. All the other stuff, even all of the other life out there is mentioned, but human beings are dealt with uniquely. Why? Because we are unique. In the breath of life, the Lord God formed man, and uh, the Adam, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. And then as we know, we have this picture, but for Adam no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, closed up the space with the flesh. The Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves unto his wife. What? And they become one flesh. And here's really important, pre-fall, they were naked and they were 
unashamed. Here is the final picture, the picture that we're given of man and woman before the fall, naked and unashamed, not ashamed of their creation, their, the, the sense of pride, the sense of ego, their self-image, all of those things that we worry ourselves over to death, literally, not there, naked and unashamed. We also see the picture as I preach and teach as we move through marriage counseling, we see the picture of marriage here because this is what is intended in marriage. We have the Adam, we have the human being who is created whole and complete, but alone. Unable to be in relationship with one of his own kind, if you will, unable to reproduce his own kind, unlike when we read in Scripture, the other animals. There's they, they, the seed-bearing trees will produce seeds of their own kind, and the animals will produce other animals of their own kind. But here is this uniqueness again, as one human is created. And then we see the picture of human relationship. We see male and female. We see the Adam, the human, being divided. We see the complete Adam being divided into male and female. And so the one became two. And now the Lord God mentions in Scripture marriage the reunification of the two and the become one. So we're gonna talk about the uniqueness of human marriage. You say, well, other animals mate for life, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine, wonderful, great. Is it of their own volition, by their own decision, and do they understand what is happening? No. Christian marriage is very important and it's not taught well the significance of it is not taught well. The picture of it is not taught well. And the goals of Christian marriage are not taught well. I didn't mean to get off on this tangent of marriage, but this is so powerful. It's such an incredible picture that it, 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 I've literally had people go, I've never seen that in Scripture. Young couples go, oh, so this is why you're so gung-ho, if you will, about Christian marriage. This is why you're so, it, it's important. I will, not, I will not hire myself out to do weddings. We will not hire the church out to do weddings. That connection and, that, and, and the Christian wedding is what I do. So the two become one. So we see, let's go back to the power of God. There, there are two examples of the power of God and the picture and the uniqueness of humanity. When we move forward in Scripture to Ezekiel 37, and the hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. Now I want to stop there because the way that that sentence is constructed is important because we see two unique individuals in that sentence. Did you hear it? The hand of the Lord was on me. God was with me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord. The two are present at the same time. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord. The two are working together right there. And this is the power of the Spirit of God indwelling an individual. Indwelling not only Ezekiel, but we will see the dry bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor 
of the valley bones that were dry, very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Good answer. Sovereign Lord, when you begin any, <laughs> any question or any response to God's being, God's, God's will in your life, sovereign Lord, I accept your will. Sovereign Lord, only you know the answer. Why? Because you are sovereign. I may like the answer. I may dislike the answer. I may feel this way or that way. God is sovereign. And your faith, your faith is in that sovereignty. Because in that sovereignty is the promise of eternal life through the resurrection of Christ. Paul says, by the very power of God, he was raised. The very power of God that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. God's sovereignty supersedes all circumstance. And so that's a really great response right there. Sovereign God, you alone know the answer. And I'm okay with that answer. Like, I'm not going to go into this guessing game with you or a discussion with you. I'm not going to pull a job on you and argue with you. You are sovereign. I am here at your command. Show me what you will. Ezekiel gets it. A lot of uh, images, you know, characters, People of Scripture don't get it, and we learn vicariously through them. But here's a guy that gets it. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, I love it, do my will. I will demonstrate my power through you. Could he have, he's speaking directly to the prophet, could he not say, I'm going to do something here as an object lesson for what I'm trying to teach you? He could have. But he has the very power of God, the very power of God that raised Christ from the dead, the very power of God, the Spirit of God within him, prophesy to these bones. Prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you. Now, we can tie those two together, can't we? Genesis 2, 7, the breath of God, the breath of life, the ruach. I am bringing my ruach to these dry bones, to this graveyard, to this valley of death. Yea, though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, what? I will breathe into these dry bones I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So, right, Ezekiel now is speaking. So I prophesied as commanded. So much going on here. The interaction between Ezekiel and sovereign God, Yahweh, is in and of itself something that is so unique and powerful. And, and Ezekiel's submission and willingness to listen and to be open and to exercise the will of God as he is commanded is powerful in and of itself. The idea that God will work through the prophet to prophesy, the idea that the God's Holy Spirit will bring life the breath of life to this valley of death, powerful. There's a lot going on here. And what I am particularly pointing out today is the very power of life, the very power of God's Holy Spirit. And how as he inhabits us, we submit ourselves to the sovereignty and to the power of God. We listen to God Ezekiel first listens and then he acts. And that the sovereignty of God and the power of his Holy Spirit in your life supersedes all circumstances. He is the advocate. He is the teacher. He is the comforter. 
He is all of that and more. And ultimately, our lives are not dependent on our circumstances. Our lives are dependent upon the resurrection of the Christ. We see resurrection, if you will, here by the power of God. Our lives are made so much richer because we are free to live regardless of our circumstances because we know that to live is to live with God within us and to die is to be with Christ win-win. And that empowers the Christian. He is bigger than our circumstances. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath prophecy. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their own feet, a vast army. Super powerful stuff. We see the definitions of ruach in there, right? We see wind, we see breath, we see life, all converging in the valley of death. So the physical is there, the physical is made, but they are not alive. They are made alive by the power of God. And the power of God is delivered unto them by the breath of God. And the breath of God is the spirit of God, the spirit of life, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of opening, our minds and our hearts to the actual reality of creation. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. And that's where we are. We're talking about that powerful stuff because we have a post-Pentecost view, understanding, living of God's Holy Spirit. And there's nothing wrong with that. I said, we're, we're post-Pentecost people. We are people of the new church that was poured out and created by the power of God's Holy Spirit, by the way, that binds Christians together. But we need to understand that he is not some tool that is wielded. He is God. And when we say the very power of God dwells within you, the Spirit of Christ the spirit of Yahweh, Yahweh, the spirit of the Lord. The more things change, the more they stay the same. He brought those bones to life from nothing. He gave you new life when you repented and turned. Father, we pray that these words will just grow your kingdom. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ that the truth of these words will penetrate the hearts that have been deceived, deceived time and time again, those who are deep in the deception and far away from you, we pray that the very power that raised Christ from the dead opens their eyes so that they may become whole and know who they are. Go back to Adam and Eve as a son or a daughter of the Most High. That's what we pray. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, I pray that you do live by the power of God's Holy Spirit today and every day. Keep your eyes up. And good Lord willing, in the river, don't rise too much. All you farmers that are like, we need the rain, okay. I'll see you Friday and turning on the lights.